It's time for Talking Pints, and I'm joined by a former Liberal De Democrat member of Parliament and many other things, and a friend of mine, Leonard Opie. Good to see you, Very sir. Very good to see you. It's been, been far well. too long. Yeah. Cheers. Now, Lembit, I guess, kind of, you were in Parliament for 13 years. Yeah. I think because of all the different things you've done since then, many people may have forgotten that Never. there once was a serious Lembit Opie. <laughs> Is How this possible? You? I mean, there's always been a serious. It's been a serious Nigel Farage, but we do it with a smile. We do. What was it like? I mean, you got elected as a Liberal Democrat MP for that seat, Montgomeryshire. Did you enjoy being an MP? Uh, at the beginning, yes. I was sort of pushed into it because at that point, being a Lib Dem was a good career move. And I was training a lot of other people, including Ed Davey at the time. And they said, look, Lemby, you've got to stand up and be candid yourself. It was great. I got elected in 97. Real privilege to be in the mother of parliament. Mm. First five years, tremendous. Second five years, even better. But then it kind of lost its luster. And that's because... Uh, at the very best, the Lib Dems were really an inspirational group and people like Paddy Ashton and I have to say Charles Kennedy. They were really good fun to work with and they had a mission and then I think the party lost its way and that's when I stopped enjoying it. You see, I mean, liberal, the old-fashioned use of the word liberal is that you believe in free speech, you believe in supporting the small, the weak, um, but you absolutely believe that people should be free to do what the hell they yeah. like, provided it doesn't impinge directly on others. Yeah. I mean, liberalism now means control. It means banning things that they don't approve of. <laughs> What's gone wrong with liberalism? No, liberalism doesn't mean control, but the Liberal Democrats today interpret it as control. Everything from what I think is a ridiculously authoritarian environmental crisis agenda, which I don't agree with at all, right through to more or less saying you can do anything you like as long as it's not offensive. Way wrong answer. Libertarianism says you can offend other people because that's what free speech is about. It's easy to let people to talk, talk if you actually agree with them. But the real test is if you're willing to tolerate people when they don't agree. Look how well you and Ken get on. You've got completely different political views, yeah. but you both respect free speech. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's what got me into no, politics. absolutely. And what was the final break? Was it Brexit that was the final break with the Lib Dems for you? Uh, it was... I thought that they were completely patronising about Brexit. At that point, I was even Remain-ish, though subsequently I think the events have proved you are 100% right. Uh, it was really the lack of liberalism, libertarianism. Yeah. You couldn't be who you wanted to be unless you conform to the, the woke agenda, which in itself is conformism. And that's when I said, I have to, I've said this publicly before, Nick Clegg didn't strike me as a liberal Democrat in my uh, traditional mm. interpretation. So it was when they didn't have a proper talk about potentially legalising drugs, which seems to be the only solution in my view. I may be wrong, but you couldn't even talk about it. They, they thought that they could impose an international agenda. Um, I think it was described once as uh, the, uh, the Britishman marching across the world with a gun in one hand and a Bible in the other. That's not liberalism. And that wasn't me. So I feel the party's moved rather than yeah, me. Yeah, well, since 2010, you've, of course, become many, many things. And very outspoken on climate change now. You know, we're told that sea levels are rising, uh, record temperatures last week. Uh, man is causing this catastrophe. What say you, Lembid Opic? It's rubbish. There is, is no Why climate is crisis. Because... Well, well, the terrible fires burning in Europe last week. Yes, but if you look at the facts, you'll find that June was a colder June than we've had for years. The Antarctic ice sheet is actually increasing. You don't get told that. Uh, in fact, the Antarctic recorded its second coldest six months last year in, in, in recorded history. That doesn't fit the zeitgeist. Fundamentally, CO2 can't drive the agenda of, of... can't drive the climate. It drives the agenda. Now, I've been studying this for 44 years. I actually had my first thing published about this whole subject when I was 15, back in 1980. So not a Johnny come lately to this. I'll challenge anyone who's watching to send me the data to show that human caused CO2 or CO2 generally is massively affecting the climate. It's not. What does affect it is orbits, the way the Earth goes around the sun, which we can't change, and the sun's cycles itself and other things to do with how currents work in the ocean. So it's a scientific view. I've got nothing invested in it in that sense, apart from the fact I love no, well, the fact we've got a new look, religion. Look, look, most people disagree with you, but you believe it and you argue for it. And while we let's stick with space, asteroids. <laughs> I mean, you became famous in Parliament, I think. <laughs> and I thought, God, he's an absolute nutcase. This bloke. I mean, a raid <laughs> off the wall. This one. And they're telling us that you know, the biggest threat we faced wasn't climate change; it was asteroids. And it's still do is. explain. It is. My grandfather was an astronomer. My father, a nuclear physicist. So, from a scientific point of view, I could see that the pioneering work my grandfather did about this—that Earth had been hit by asteroids before and it would happen again—was on the money. And we need 
needed to do something about it. Because never mind if we have a warm climate, if we all get incinerated by a 10 kilometer wide asteroid, then there won't be many uh, awards for saying I told you so. I actually m made a rather thoughtless statement. In one but isn't this speech. more alarmist than even the climate change uh, people? Yes, but with a good cause. Uh, the dinosaurs aren't here really to pick up the pieces. They were incinerated by a single object that came in over the Gulf of Mexico. We saw something in Russia not long ago, which actually injured 2,000 people. In 1908, an object hit Siberia big enough to incinerate everything around us right out to the M25. So this has happened before. 50,000 tonnes of space rock hits the Earth every year, mm. but normally in small bits. Mm. So maybe I do sound cranky on this, but mm. the science is with me. Oh, thanks very much indeed. <laughs> no, that's it's all right. I, I will find you and say I told you so. That would be my last no, breath. Well, I, we, we, we'll all be dead. It won't matter. Well, uh, you know. Know. So, well, OK, fine. I, I hear what you're saying. What could we do about it? Uh, we can actually mitigate. The way to do it is to see these things coming 10, 15, 20 years out. Give them a little nudge. A small nudge. A nudge? Yeah. yeah. That's what all you can do. Don't smash them up because then lots of bits will hit the earth instead of one. But if you had a, let's say, if you had a car rolling down a hill mm. and the hill was a million miles long, a tiny nudge will mean it'll miss the house. You see, it's fascinating, Linda. I, I, mean, I love talking to you because, <laughs> you know... There are subjects I can discuss with you that I don't discuss with any other human being. I know. And I, and I wonder, because you had, in the late 90s, quite a, well, a near-death experience, um, and I've been through similar things myself. You went through a paragliding accident. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yes, uh, we share that. We both nearly died mm. uh, because of aeronautics. Now, I'm a passionate pilot. I love aviation. I think it's uh, a, a great uh, field of uh, achievement for humanity. I made the mistake of becoming a paraglider. That's like a parachute that you jump off and actually are foolish enough to think you can fly with. It's... Uh, this is quite typical, I think, of our guests. But well, yes, but I, I, I was never one to calculate the risks. <laughs> but you got lucky. <laughs> uh, but uh, so did I, because both of us could have been killed. The wind changed, so I made a mistake with the air brakes. One way or the other, the thing collapsed. And um, we're about on the sixth floor here. Mm -hmm. That's how far I fell. And I landed wow. vertically. I broke my, uh, my sternum, my ribs, my jaw, and I broke my back in 12 places. Now, it was touch and go. I walked off the mountain with help from my friend Rob Burridge. Without him, I'd be dead. And it does change your point of view. And I'm sure you had a similar experience when that plane flipped over uh, and, and you faced death as well. And it really was life and death. 65 miles from that mountainside to Shrewsbury Hospital, they saved my life. Is it a different Lembert Opic after that? Yes, but not immediately. I remember at the time knowing it was going to change me. I think I was fairly selfish, fairly self-obsessed. The politics of Parliament does that to you. But over time you begin to realise it can change you. I've had reconstructive surgery mm. right up till two years ago, in fact. My, my whole face and jaw structures had to be rebuilt because I couldn't eat anymore. Uh, the reality is all the things we moan about, all the things we complain about, are really trivial when you're actually faced with death. And I see something liberating in the way you behave, perhaps for the same reason. And if you haven't been through it, you forget that a late bus or an expensive pint is nothing when you remember that you are at least here to, to, yeah, to have I, those experiences. I, I promised myself after the plane crash I would never let little things mm. really anger me. And I've probably failed on that once <laughs> or twice, but I do re-remind myself <laughs> quite regularly. Well, certainly what uh, the accident didn't do was make you shy with women. Um, <laughs> you say this that. Is, this is, well, I mean, Sean Lloyd, <laughs> the cheeky girl. I mean, and suddenly, <laughs> Lembido Pick, the Liberal Democrat Member of Parliament and the guy with views that are considered off the wall by many, but he believes in. And suddenly you're, you're tabloid Lembid, aren't you? Uh, yes, because the media love what seems like eccentricity. But you loved it. I was flattered by it. I didn't invite you it. You loved it. Oh, I ran with it. Do you say you don't do the same thing, Mr. Farage? I'm Parage? talking to you. You're not talking to me. OK, all right. Sorry. <laughs> no, yeah. no, good no, point. Well made. No, no. no, I mean, look, I, I, of course, of course, you know, when I was very much on the front pages, yeah. of course I loved it and I enjoyed it. But, I mean, the cheeky girl thing particularly, you reveled in it, Yeah, well, you? it was an authentic relationship. She's a, she was a great girl. She is a great girl, selling cars up in, in Yorkshire now, as, as is her sister. They're really decent people, and that was an authentic relationship. But what was interesting, of course, I didn't see it the way the world looked in. And I was naive to an extent because... There was a lot of, first of all, you're kind of uh, adorned on the headlines and in the papers because it's fun, but it turns against you as well. Mm. You're supping with the devil in that situation. And it probably was instrumental in my unplanned defeat in 2010. Would I change things? No, because at the end of the day, 
I'd have been compromising what I believed in for the sake of being in politics, and so many people corrode their yeah, personalities yeah. and their values for doing that. <laughs> no, so, I agree with so, that. So, so I was drawn into the celebrity, and it is fun. Sometimes it's really flattering, but then at the same time, it's a very, very hot potato. And sometimes oh, you get burned. It's like going to a good party. But there's, you know, there could be a hangover the next morning. You might say that can possibly come. No. <laughs> Boris could help us with that one. <laughs> <laughs> and since then, so Radio Kent, you've been yeah. doing, and you're enjoying hosting yeah. programmes. You're a regular yeah. on GB News. Yeah. I mean, is this is is Lembanopic now going to become and stay as a media personality, a commentator? What are your plans? Well, I do quite a lot of broadcasting, and yeah. uh, I'd love to carry on doing that. Do quite a lot of public affairs. I am still doing space. I'm the chairman of Parliament for Escadia, the world's first space nation. I'll get you an honorary membership. <laughs> well, for that. I say. Um, and so I'm still doing that. But yeah. at the end of the day, I've got two kids, and yeah. that's really important to me. And that's happened quite late in life. Yeah, five years and, and one year. I want to call one of them pension plan and the other one COVID, but that was overruled. <laughs> it's Angela and Maria, as it turns out. Um, and Sabina's <laughs> doing a good job of, of being them. I'm probably better than I am as a, as a dad. When it comes down to it, all of this adds up to uh, something that was told. I think it was by the Dalai Lama, he said, not to me directly. He said, the way to make God laugh is to tell him your plans. So I don't know where I'm going, no. but I'm enjoying the journey. And you look at the country today, somebody elected to Parliament 25 mm. years ago. How does Britain look to you today? Uh, it's on a downwards curve. I think there was this huge optimism in the early noughties. I remember thinking in about 0102 when... Parliament was great. It was inspirational. It was positive. There was cross-party friendship. There's no doubt the Blair-Clinton relationship really was world-beating. And you felt things were great. You could actually get a 110% mortgage back then, if you remember. Now it seems that we're... Well, look, look what that led to. Well, it led to a lot of success and then a terrible crash in 08. Yeah. But that wasn't necessarily because of what was going right in 2002. I think what's happened is partly because politics has become more oppressed and it's got career politicians. People have done nothing else. They don't really relate to what it's like to be in a dole queue. I was on the dole in the 80s the, and many others were too. You have to swim up the river when you're out here. It's not performance related pay, particularly when you're in Parliament. No. And I think that's, that's what's causing the problem. Trust versus Sunak. Well, I'm not a Tory, so I won't express my view, but they're really going to have to reinvigorate faith in politics. Everybody knows I think Starmer's doing a really poor job as opposition leader. Uh, and so, so who's leading the country? Who's going to inspire Dave, the country? And Ed Dave is leading the Lib Dems to big by election wins. Well, he has done very well. I used to share an office with him. And frankly, I, I thought they would win something, but fair play to Ed. He's, he's He's capitalising it in one way, but he hasn't converted that into a very public building for the party. He's doing well by default because the others are doing badly. Who is the Churchill? Who is the leader? Who is the Farage to lead this country? And I think that that's one thing that's really missing. The best years of my political life were when you had inspirational leaders like Kennedy, like Blair, I have to say, and even people like Haig, who were really engaging. Now we've gone... And funny. And funny engaging, and they didn't take themselves too seriously. Now that's been replaced by sepia and grey, and that's the last thing a country in trouble needs. Final thought. If we get, after the next election, a Lib Dem... Labour, SNP coalition, and we get proportional representation. Would that be a good thing or a bad thing for public life in our country? Uh, uh, there are three problems with what you've said. SNP uh, in that coalition means there'll be an independence for Scotland. No, they'll get another referendum and they'll lose. Uh, that would, the deal would probably have to be more sophisticated than that. But OK, maybe, maybe Nicola Sturgeon would go for that. You'd certainly be reopening the break of the, of the union, which I'm not too keen on. So that's a negative in my view. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of Labour under Starmer and the Lib Dems, Ed Davey would play, play, a, straight, play a straight hand, but I just, for reasons I won't even go on to, uh, into on air, no. I don't think Starmer is the right person to lead this country, and that's a problem. And then I suppose the biggest question is, can anyone bring this country together instead of being divided? I don't think that coalition would do it. So... Let's, okay. let's hope for the best, but we've yeah. got to prepare that things won't necessarily get better. But, of course, if called upon to serve under your government, no reasonable offer refused. I'll drink to that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Limpit, for joining me. That was Limpit Epic on Talking Pines. <laughs> Terrific, thank you.